from writing that first book, Gardens of Delight, a simple introduction to Islam, circumstances led me to get involved in writing more. So I was invited to give another talk, and then another talk, and then another one. And then a radio program, and then a TV program. And then I was asked to start writing for a newspaper in Egypt, and then another newspaper, and then for a magazine and then for uh, an Islamic website, which I still write for regularly. And then finally, I, I, I established my own website, idrisalfiq.com, in which I tried in a very simple way just to sum up the work I do and the things I've written for people who are not Muslim and for those who are. I've worked with young people in one way or another all of my life. Uh, young people keep you young. And I, I enjoy being with young people. I like going out to eat with them and with my students. I meet my students. Sometimes we, we walk and we talk and we laugh. And it's a good way of getting to know one another. Muslim young people have the same concerns as young people all over the world. They think about study and about jobs and about relationships. They're trying to establish who they are, working out their own identity. And it's a great privilege to be involved with young people because young people say things as they are. They don't have a lot of the hang-ups that older people have. They speak the truth. They make mistakes, but alhamdulillah, we've all made mistakes. And, and we learn from our mistakes. Some people say to me, what advice do you give to the youth? Well, I don't give anyone advice. You know, I've made enough mistakes in my own life not to give advice. All, all we do, we talk about Islam. And I, and I try to explain Islam in a very simple way. I, I'm not a Muslim scholar, I'm a very simple man, and, and I just talk about my own experience of Islam in the language that ordinary people talk. Another aspect of my work is working with people who are new to Islam, with new Muslims. Of course, Muslims believe that Islam has existed since the beginning of time, that it's the natural religion of mankind, and that all people in a natural state are really born Muslim. It's only the actions of other people make them Christian or Jew or whatever religion. So this is why we never say that people convert 
to Islam. I like to say that when, when people come to Islam later in life, they embrace Islam. One of the problems we have as Muslims, though, is we spend millions of pounds calling people to Islam. We spend millions of pounds on videos, on books, on cassettes, on talks, on all manner of things, calling people to declare shahada. And the problem is, once we have called people, we leave them and we don't help them in their faith. At, the, at that very start, when they're making their, their baby steps as Muslims, we as the Muslim community should be most careful to take care of them. But instead, we often leave them on their own. But instead, we often leave them on their own. And this is to our shame. At the end of time, we'll have to answer to them. In the modern world, the internet is one of the main ways that people communicate. And I spend a lot of time, really a lot of time, on the computer, emailing people, answering emails, writing. I write for a number of Islamic websites. In fact, I have my own website now. I realize that this is one of the best ways to communicate with people. So my own website, idristafiq.com, very simple. It has three main sections. One is called Muslim Youth. One is called Heritage, and it talks about the great history and, and, and the, the, the treasures of Islam. And the other one is called Islam and the West. And in many ways, those three areas embrace the sort of work that I do. And through the website, people can see what I've been doing, where I'm going, what I've said, what I've written. And also, it's a wonderful way, it's a truly privileged way that I hear from other people. And it really is wonderful each day to receive emails from people all over the world that I've never met, saying words of encouragement and words of help. Allah. Gardens of Delight, A Simple Introduction to Islam, was the first book I wrote. And it was written for people in the West who know nothing about Islam. But to my great surprise, another audience grew up, an audience of young Muslims. And so this, these are the two groups I write for now. I write for people in the West who know nothing about Islam. But I also write for Muslims, reminding them how beautiful Islam is. This year I'm, I'm publishing a number of books called Ask About Islam. The first one, it, talking to young Muslims. Others talking to British Muslims, talking to Muslim sisters, talking to new Muslims. One of the great things, really special things about my work now is that it affords me the chance to travel all over the world. And it really is wonderful. It's wonderful because I get to meet very, very good people. I get to experience many different cultures and many different flavors of Islam. We might call them different flavors. Islam is the same all over the world. There is only one Islam. But visiting different Muslim lands, different Arab lands, you see different aspects of Islam where the people treasure Islam in a different way. Let me give you one example. Last winter, I was invited to visit Toronto in Canada by the Islamic Institute of Toronto. I was invited to speak at their annual winter dinner. It took place on the 25th of December when the rest of Canada was celebrating Christmas and eating turkey and mince pies and the thing that really struck me as marvelous was this young, vibrant Muslim community gathered together. They had a, a marvelous dinner, six, seven hundred people there. I, I was the speaker at their dinner, but I, I learned more than anything I said. I was touched 
by the way these Muslims joined together, celebrated their faith, celebrated socially, and taught not only me, but the rest of Canada, that Islam can, can live very comfortably in the West. No problem, no clash of civilizations. Islam's at home in every civilization. Another very memorable visit was to the UK in February 2007. I was invited to go there by the, the Federation of Student Islamic Societies of, of the UK and Ireland and spoke in, in many universities. And it really was an occasion when I had wished the television cameras had been with me. Because instead of the, the image of Islam that we see on the TV in the West, those cameras would have shown polite, well-behaved, well-mannered, faith-filled young men and women who were keen to learn more about Islam but who were also very keen to play a full part in, in their society. And one thing that struck me very much was even though they're having so much heaped upon them and being blamed as the scapegoat for so many things, these young Muslim men and women could laugh and joke about it because they could say, SubhanAllah, Allah is in charge. So it was a great opportunity again to learn from young people and to see how despite all the pressure that they're under, Muslims in Britain can be such a good example, holding fast to the rope of Allah. Another invitation was to speak at al Akhwain University in Morocco, at Ifran. Now again, as I say, it's a wonderful opportunity, all of this travelling, to speak about Islam, because I had no idea that Morocco was such a beautiful country. I had no idea that it had mountains and forests and rivers and lakes. And I was invited by a group of young professionals, university students too, to speak about interfaith dialogue and leadership. And, and they had a very, very splendid uh, conference at al University, sharing their ideas and showing their love for their country. And this, you know, is, this really strikes me. Of all the countries I've been to, the Arab countries, the Arab people that I speak to, Muslims and Arabs, they love their country. I love Syria. I love Morocco. I love Egypt. This is what they tell me. And it really is heartwarming. Especially when the television is telling them all the time that their countries are backward, that their countries are lacking in this, that their countries are falling behind the West in that. It is wonderful. And so in Morocco, for example, these young men and women who were very well educated, many of them doing master's degrees and doctoral degrees, many of them businessmen, business women, were not only saying how much they loved their country, but also what they wanted to do for their country and how as Muslims they could help their country. And inshallah and alhamdulillah, I, I, I'm, I'm invited to play a very small part in, in encouraging Muslims. In fact, I'd say the thing I, I do most, the thing I have to offer Muslims most, is to encourage them that Islam is great and that Muslims should be proud of being Muslim and that Islam is no threat to any of their countries at all, but indeed, given the chance, would enrich them. One of the things I learned long ago was that if you're going to speak to people about matters of faith, you have to speak to them in a language they understand. Otherwise, it's so much hot air and people will sit looking at you and they really don't know what you're talking about. I'll give you an example. Something really wonderful happened. I, I visited the International Islamic University of Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. 
And much to my surprise, almost my horror, the, the students there asked me to give the khutbah in the university mosque on, on the Friday. And I found myself, we, we entered the mosque from, from the back, from the imam's offices, and I went up the steps of the, of the pulpit, the minbar, from, from behind. So when I opened the door, I, my eyes were greeted by 5,000 people for Friday prayers. And really what I had to say was very simple, very simple. So much so, and I don't say it to blow my own trumpet. I say that when the, when the sermon, the khutbah was finished, I found it very difficult to get out of the mosque. Because many of the people crowded round me and said, no one's ever talked to us like that before. No one's ever spoke in a simple way like that before. And, and all I did, I didn't say anything special. I mean, they knew more about Islam than I do. They've been Muslims much longer than I have. All I told them was that, we, we, in fact, I spoke about having idols in our hearts. We can talk about idols up here as something in the past in, in Mecca. But we have idols in here that we still haven't got rid of. So I just talked to, talked to the brothers and sisters at the Friday khutbah about how to take away the things in our hearts that keep us from Allah. And alhamdulillah, they, they were listening. They were listening. You know, I go to the, the mosque every Friday, and often, I blame no one, but often the people are told, you must do this, and you must do that, and you must be careful to do this, and you must be prompt to do that, when really what they want to hear, they want to hear how to get on with their wives. They want to hear how to deal with their children. They want to hear how as good Muslims, they deal with employers who are unjust to them. And we should begin, it really is very important, in talking about Islam, we should begin where people are. And we should feed their hearts, we should touch their hearts. I know that Almighty Allah brought me to Islam by touching my heart. And we can, we can go through the motions of things. We can declare all manner of beliefs. But unless it touches our hearts, a lot of it is so much hot air. So, inshallah, as Muslims, by being good Muslims, we, we, we can tell the world about Islam without any speeches, without standing on boxes and shouting. We needn't mention Islam. But by living good lives, by being good men and women, by being faithful to prayer, by getting to know the life and example of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, by learning from the heroes of our, of our faith, by learning from the great history of Islam, and by being polite to one another, by greeting one, one another with assalamu alaikum, and in all things saying alhamdulillah, then the world will see what Islam is like. Damascus in Syria was chosen as the Arab capital of culture for 2008. And I, I've been very lucky to, to be invited to Syria a number of times to speak at conferences and to, to, to meet many, many interesting Muslim scholars. Damascus is famous for its scholarship. And I was very lucky to come for a book launch. Uh, my book, Talking to Young Muslims, we actually launched it in Damascus as part of the Arab capital of culture. I'll give you an example from Syria of, of how we must grasp every chance we can to speak about Islam. I was in Damascus in a restaurant with, with a friend of mine and there were a group of ladies, a group of Muslim ladies there for lunch. And there was no plan, nothing, none of it was planned, but I ended up giving these ladies a little talk about my journey to Islam without any plan. And we must always use every opportunity without standing on a box and shouting of telling the world what Islam is like. And the prayer started. And when, when it started, I began to cry. And I cried, and I cried, and I cried like a baby. Like a baby. And when the, when the prayer was finished, I went to Yusuf Islam and I said, Brother, brother, I want to be Muslim. 
I want to be Muslim. And he said to me, repeat after me, Ashahadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashahadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. And since then, my life just completely changed. I must also say that the image people have, and I can't fail to say this, the image that people have in the West of Syria is just groundless. People have this notion of Syria being one thing, that people are very kind, that people are religious. It's a lovely place. Perhaps because of my background as a religious and as a Roman Catholic priest, I've become heavily involved in inter-religious dialogue, talking to people of other faiths. There's a great deal of misunderstanding about what inter-religious dialogue really is. It is not a belief that all religions are the same, and it doesn't really matter what you believe. It's not that. If it was that, I would not be involved. Islam is perfect. Islam, as we've said many times, is the natural religion of mankind. The purpose of inter interfaith, interreligious dialogue, is simply that people of faith have far more in common with each other than the secular people who would banish religion and faith and spirituality from our societies. And in a world torn apart by religious strife, where people are starving and poor and hungry, Religious people should spend more time talking to each other than arguing over trivial things. Idris Taufik, an esteemed author, religious scholar and convert to Islam. Following his degree in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome, he spent many years as head of religious studies in different schools throughout the UK. I've always Before enjoyed speaking to Islam people, speaking to crowds, and I've always been a confident person. But Islam has given me a real confidence in my personality. It's strengthened me as a person. Islam has made me strong, and it's also taught me to be very gentle. Our beloved Prophet والسلام, told us that when we want to talk to people about Islam, we should use wise words and beautiful preaching. He also told us that all we need to call others to Islam is one ayat of Quran and a good heart. I'm really blessed in that my work of talking to people about Islam brings me into contact with princes and ambassadors it brings me into contact with little boys on the street who have no shoes on their feet, with sisters and brothers, with young and old, because Islam is for all people. Because Islam is for all people. People ask me, what is the greatest problem faced by Muslims today? I'm a, I'm a very simple man, and I think the answer is very simple. The answer is that as Muslims, we don't pray. We don't pray. We can spend five hours sitting in front of a television. We can spend hours chatting on the internet about people we'll never meet. We can spend hours on the phone talking about nothing. But when the Adan sounds, we're very slow to pray, instead of being prompt to run to pray. We talk about calling people to Islam, and we don't even get up in the morning to pray Salat al-Fajr. This is the problem. The world tells Muslims that Islam is very harsh. And unfortunately, many of us have fallen into the trap and we believe it. Islam is not harsh. So the greatest problem we face as Muslims is that we don't know the real Islam ourselves. We don't know the real Islam ourselves. It's not by standing on a box and giving a sermon and pointing fingers at people that you will call anyone to Islam. The world will sit up and listen to what we say if we were truly to live as good Muslim brothers and sisters, if we are prompt to prayer, if we recite the Holy Quran 
and learn the, the sayings and the traditions of our beloved Prophet We would turn the world upside down with such a message and without any words.